Guns? Ah, there we go. Good evening. Uh, for those of you that weren't here last time, my name is Eugene Beach. On behalf of the Highland Township Historical Society, let me welcome you to the second of our presentations on what I'm calling the Pioneer Experience. Uh, for those of you that may have missed our initial session, uh, the goal of these talks is to get a sense of what it was like to uh, live here in the township during the pioneer period from 1832 to roughly 1852. Uh, in that first talk, we focused on the family unit itself, the individual family, uh, as a self-contained unit, including such things as shelter, land clearing, etc. cetera. Uh, if you missed that first session, our supervisor, Rick Hamill, has kindly posted a video of it on our township's YouTube <coughs> website. Uh, tonight we're going to take a step back and look at the larger environment in which the pioneers lived, and by environment, I mean not only the physical environment, uh, but social and cultural environment as well. So we're going to talk about such things as trails, roads, interactions with native people, uh, local government, and of all things, booze. And since that's a lot of ground to cover, let me just jump right in and get started. Native peoples have been living here in Highland uh, for centuries, if not thousands of years before the first white settlers ever arrived. Uh, this particular graphic is from a 1931 atlas of Indian sites here in Michigan. And I've separated the Highland portion of it. And as you can see from that red triangle, if you look at the map key, that indicates that there was once a native village in what is now uh, Highland Recreation Area. Uh, I'm told that the DNR has a pretty good idea of exactly where it was, uh, but they're a little hesitant to disclose the location because they don't want to encourage uh, unauthorized digging. By the time the first settlers began arriving here in 1832, however, any permanent villages or encampments uh, in Highland had been abandoned for some time. Under the 1807 Treaty of Detroit, the Ojibwa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandotte had given up all claims to southeastern lower Michigan, this green area that you see here, which includes Highland Township right about there. Um, even so, Native peoples continued to pass through the township, uh, often in considerable numbers, uh, during the first years of settlement. That's because the same 1807 treaty by which they gave up all that land uh, promised them, quote, an annuity forever of $2,400 to be paid at Detroit. So every year, groups would set out from their reservations, including a 3,000-acre tract that was up here in Shiawassee County, uh, and travel along various trails which led to Detroit so that they could get their annuity. And as we'll see in a minute, there were several of those trails which passed through Highland Township. And since it might take days or even weeks to make that journey, it wasn't uncommon for a number of these groups to stop here and rest, eat, or sleep. Uh, an 1877 history of Oakland County, for example, says that there formerly existed within the limits of the township on the east side of Section 34 a general camping ground where the Indians used to halt in their peregrinations through the forest, and there be those who still remember the camping ground and the interesting scenes which its remembrance presents. Uh, I suspect that campsite was located at the south end of Pettibone, Lower Pettibone Lake, uh, at or near the point where, as we'll see, the Shiawassee Trail forded Pettibone Creek. The accounts of several of the Early pioneers likewise mentioned native peoples. Uh, Janet McCall, who, as you'll remember from last time, grew up near Lower Pettibone Lake, says that, quote, there were a lot of Indians, but they were peaceable and quiet. They used to come along in tribes, you know, and they would go to Canada, I think she meant Detroit, after presence and would stop and beg for bread. They had a word for it that sounded like quashon, 
Sometimes they would have little baskets to sell. Uh, another early settler in the area, Mary Opino, grew up in Section 3 of Milford, just over the, the border from Highland, also recalls Indians passing in 1834. She says, quote, around the first of autumn, I saw all or nearly all of the Indians in the territory of Michigan. They were on their way to Detroit to receive their yearly payments. From early dawn of the day until late at night, the Indian trail was crowded with Indians and their ponies, close quote. Uh, even as late as the mid-1840s, uh, Native peoples were still a part of the Highland uh, pioneer experience. James Rowe, who was born in 1838, says that, quote, we used to see Indians quite often as they passed en route to Detroit with their furs. They were usually friendly unless they had imbibed too much of the white man's firewater. Early one morning, a half dozen of them came into our cabin to get warm. Father, in building the fire, accidentally, question mark, tipped over their whiskey jug. One of the squaws got down and sipped up the liquor, exclaiming, so coot, so coot. I surmised that father had tipped the jug on purpose as he was an inveterate enemy to liquor. On another occasion, as my sister Eliza and myself were in the wood, a band of Indians came along on their ponies. Sister was eating a bega. Who knows what a bega is? A bagel? Bega, B-A-G-A. -A. <laughs> now, there, there, there were, uh, Schwartz's Deli wasn't here. Uh, a bega was what they called a rutabaga. Sister was eating a bega, which one of the squaws evidently coveted. The squaw was so persistent in her efforts to get the bega, and using sign language, which of course the poor girl didn't understand, she finally threw the bega and ran toward the house. Miss Lowe dismounted, secured the coveted bega, and went on her way rejoicing. Now, I can't leave that quote uh, without explaining why Rowe would call a native woman Miss Lowe. Uh, way back in 1734, Alexander Pope, uh, the famous English poet, published a lengthy philosophical poem entitled An Essay on Man. It was a very popular poem. A number of its lines have since become uh, commonplace sayings, like hope springs eternal. That comes from Pope. Now, at one point, he tries to make the I get the idea across that having too much knowledge can interfere with our understanding of the divine, whereas more primitive people don't have that problem. And he introduces that idea with these lines. Lo, the poor Indian whose untutored mind sees God in clouds or hears him in the wind, his soul proud science never taught to stray as far as the solar walk or milky way, that simple nature to his hope has given behind the cloud top hill a humbler heaven. Now, when you read that and you see low with an exclamation point, it's clear he's saying behold or see. But there were a lot of people that only heard the poem. It was recited to them, particularly children in school. And so they would hear low the poor Indian. And they would assume that low was the poor Indian's name. And pretty soon this became something of a meme, uh, and you hear people in diaries and letters and so forth uh, jokingly referring to Lo the Poor Indian, or Poor Lo. Um, it was not so much a dig at the native peoples as it was a knowing look at these yokels, if you will, that didn't understand the true grammar of the poem. Um, you know, that's the problem with giving talks like this at the library. Uh, you come here expecting to hear about Highland history and find yourself in the middle of a poetry seminar. <laughs> in all seriousness, however, I think the fact that Lowe, or that uh, James Rowe, not only knew of this poem, but could quote from it in such a jocular fashion, uh, tells you something about frontier education in the one-room schoolhouse in which he uh, received his education over on Hickory Ridge Road. Uh, I'd wager if you asked 100 people today about that quote, uh, only a handful have ever heard of Pope, 
uh, much less familiar with anything written by him. Uh, anyway, let me say one more thing about Rowe's recollections of seeing native peoples. He was, as I said, born in 1838. His sister Eliza was born in 1836. So assuming they were around seven and nine years old uh, at the time they met Miss Lowe, we're talking the mid-1840s. Now by this time, that reservation up in Shiawassee County was no more. Uh, it had been abandoned as part of the 1837 uh, Treaty of Saginaw. So it's unlikely that the Indians uh, James and his sister encountered were from that area. Uh, instead, I suspect they were members of two Ojibwa families who continued to live among the lakes in southeast Heartland, uh, roughly three miles west of the Roe home. Uh, one family consisted of a former chief known as Old Shaka, who lived in a crude bark hut on the isthmus that separates Round and Long Lakes. Uh, he had a son and two daughters. Uh, and then he had a friend, Portabeek, who lived nearby in a similar dwelling, along with his two sons and two daughters. It's not quite certain how long they stayed in Heartland. Uh, there is some circumstantial evidence they were there as late as the 1850s. But in all events, uh, both in terms of the number of Indians that were in the area and, and the proximity to the Roe home, I suspect those were the uh, native peoples that uh, James Roe remembered passing through. Now, as it turns out, uh, the Indians left behind them uh, something that would prove of immense importance to Highland's early settlement, and that was their trail system. Uh, so let's turn our attention to pioneer trails, roads, and transportation. I assume all of you have, at some point or another, driven along one of our remaining unpaved roads, such as East Livingston or West Wardlow. Whether you love them or hate them, uh, they can certainly be a challenge to drive on at times. We often call them dirt roads, but technically speaking, most of them are gravel roads with a hard-packed uh, gravel base. Uh, if you want to see how much worse a true dirt road can be, take Duck Lake north of Harbor High on your way to White Lake Road, uh, otherwise known as the Lunar Landscape. And even though that stretch has been on maps Dating back to the 1800s, there's apparently some lingering dispute over its legal status, which is why the Road Commission won't maintain it. Um, this photo, by the way, is of East Wardlow Road, just east of Harvey Lake. I think it was taken in the 40s or maybe 50s, uh, back when it too was still more or less a true uh, dirt road. But whether dirt or gravel, and regardless of how poorly maintained, an early Highland pioneer would have thought he had died and gone to heaven uh, to have such a road. Because when the first settlers began arriving here, uh, and for several years thereafter, the only thing they had to travel on were the old Indian trails. Now when folks hear the word trail today, they probably picture the kind of thing that you'll find in our state parks, four or five feet wide, nicely groomed with all the brush cut back, maybe some wood chips spread on it. That is not what these were. Uh, remember that the native peoples in this area did not have wagons. A lot of them did not have horses or ponies, and so they walked. And if there was a group of them traveling together, they would walk what was called Indian fire or single fire. So many of these trails were, in reality, little more than footpaths. Uh, they were well marked, to be sure, but sometimes only wide enough for a man to walk along. Uh, indeed, there are a number of maps and other documents which make uh, pretty clear distinctions between paths, which were suitable for walking, trails, which were wide enough for a horse and rider, and roads, which were wide enough to accommodate a team and a wagon or sled. Uh, this is a, the Oakland County portion of an 1833 map of Michigan. I've outlined future Highland in red. And as you can see, this particular trail moving through here is called an Indian Path. Um, as inadequate as these trails were, however, they were often the only infrastructure uh, that existed. 
and several of them were such importance to the history of the area uh, that they were given names. Uh, in Highland, for example, we had three named trails, plus a fourth um, unnamed trail that was nevertheless of considerable local importance. So let's see where these ran. This is the Highland portion of a map drawn by Michigan surveyor Orange, Orange Risden in 1825. I don't know how many people exist in history with the first name Orange, but that was his name. Um, this predates the settlement of Highland by some seven or eight years, but as you can see, um, what would become the township is pretty well defined. Here's White Lake, it had already been named by that time. Um, here's Lower Pettibone, Pettibone Creek, uh, over here is Dunham, and then this group of lakes in here. Uh, actually for a long time had the name Society Lakes collectively. It wasn't until they named each one of them that they um, abandoned that term. Anyway, what I want to direct your attention to are the dotted lines that you see because those are the Indian trails that ran through our township. One of the most important is, oops, pardon me, one of the most important is this one running diagonally across the southwestern and northwestern part of the township. That is the Shiawassee Trail, so-called because it ran all the way from Detroit up to Byron in Shiawassee County. Uh, along the way, it passed through that Shiawassee Indian Reservation that I mentioned. Uh, as such, it was a major route not only for the Indians going back and forth to Detroit, but also for settlers making their way from Detroit into the interior of the state, western Oakland County, eastern Livingston County, and up into Shiawassee County. Um, as I said, it started in Detroit, it meandered uh, through Oakland County, made its way to Walled Lake, uh, northeast part of Milford, and then uh, entered Highland down in section 34 or 35. Um, from there it ran northwest, and at some point had to ford Pettibone Creek, uh, most likely at the southern end of Lower Pettibone Lake, basically where Reed Road uh, would later cross it. North of that, of course, the lake's in the way, and south of it is, is pretty marshy. Uh, after crossing the creek, it then proceeded northwest. This particular map shows it passing uh, north of Dunham Lake. I've seen some that suggest it may have gone south of Dunham Lake. And truth be told, it may have done both because these paths were not laid out by a surveyor. They were established by usage uh, and they may very well have shifted this way or that over, over time. The second named trail that passed through Highland is this one that is up here in section one. Uh, this was known as the White Lake Trail since as you can see it passes the northeast shore of White Lake uh, this map actually shows it a little bit closer to the lake than, than a number of others. Um, indeed, Rose Center Road in both Highland and Rose are thought to follow the original route. Uh, the White Lake Trail was likewise a major access into the state's interior. It started in Pontiac, wound its way around Orchard and Cass Lake, and then cuts across White Lake Township diagonally clips the corner of Highland and then proceeds on up into um, Rose. From there it turned a little more westerly, if you know where White Lake Road crosses 23 uh, today. It then intersected the Shiawassee Trail and ended up in, in Byron. Uh, the third name trail isn't shown on this map, but it is mentioned in an old county history. It was called the Walled Lake Trail and was described as a by-road uh, leading from the Grand River Trail. Uh, it reportedly entered Highland in the south down in section 35, so down in this area. Uh, and then I suspect continued north, curving around White Lake and eventually connecting with the White Lake Trail. Uh, it would have been basically a cutoff or a bypass for those wanting to uh, go from one trail to the other. Where would, where would Fish Lake be? Fish Lake would, oh, 
you get around about eight or seventeen. Okay. Oh, that's fish. Okay. So this is rows north of that heavy line. Local road comes down here, comes across Fish Lake Road and these areas. Okay. All right. Yes, indeed. Um, last but not least, I want you to take note of this trail running uh, west. It starts about the entrance, eastern entrance of Prestwick, then cuts across the three sections of Highland, and it ends up over in this area where uh, Chaka and Potabeek are, are said to have lived. Uh, historically, it didn't have a name, probably because it was too short to be of regional significance, uh, but I've taken to calling it the Highland Heartland Trail since it does play a major role in the history of both townships. Uh, now to see how important all these trails were, we need only look back to the map that I showed last week depicting the early land purchases. Uh, as you may recall, the red is 1832 sales, the green is 1833, and the purple is 1834. Only in this case, I've taken off all the modern roads and added the trails as shown on the Rusden map. So here we have the Tenney settlement, and as you can see, it's got access to both this Highland Heartland Trail and the Shiawassee Trail. And up here we have the small group of purchases in section one, and they tend to have focused uh, or be centered around the old White Lake Trail. Um, now you know how it is today. Uh, new subdivision goes in, traffic increases, and suddenly folks start clamoring for a new or improved road. Uh, the pioneers were no different. Indeed, if you read the minutes of the Michigan Territorial Council and later the state legislature, uh, almost every other page mentions a petition to, quote, lay out and establish a road, close quote, from one town to another. And just as the federal government today spends money to build and maintain the interstate system, uh, back then it was appropriating funds for so-called military roads so that you could move troops quickly from one location to another if the need arose. Woodward Avenue, for example, uh, started out as a military road that was going to run from Detroit to Saginaw. Uh, by the time they reached Pontiac, however, the threat from either Indians or the British had pretty much receded, and so they turned the whole thing over to the state. Believe it or not, another federal road was initially planned to pass through Highland. Uh, starting in 1825, Michigan residents petitioned Congress to survey and build, quote, a good road leading from Detroit to the seat of justice of Shiawassee, <coughs> following as near as may be the trail or Indian path, close quote. Well, at that time, the seat of justice of Shiawassee was Byron, and the trail was that Shiawassee trail that you see cutting diagonally across Highland. Um, the House of Representatives did pass several bills to establish that road, uh, but none of them were approved by the Senate. As the pace of settlement increased, however, so did calls for Congress to act. Um, two new petitions were submitted in June and October of 1831, each of which with over 200 signatures, which when you figure the population we had here at the time, a uh, sizable number of Michigan residents wanted that road. So finally, on July 4 of 1832, uh, Congress responded and they authorized the president to appoint three commissioners to, quote, explore, survey, and mark in the most eligible course a road from Detroit westerly by way of Shiawassee to the mouth of the Grand River, close quote. Uh, actual survey work thereafter commenced in September of 1832 under the leadership of General Joseph Brown. As it turns out, however, uh, the route that Brown actually surveyed bore little resemblance to either what the citizens had petitioned for or for that matter what Congress had authorized. Uh, he followed the Shiawassee Trail as far as Farmington and then turned almost due west 
running well south of the seat of justice in Byron, and in the process bypassed all of northwestern Oakland County, including Highland Township. Local reaction to that change of route was both swift and fierce. Uh, between December of 1833 and January of 1834, over 400 citizens signed a new petition asking Congress to shift the route back north and restore the original, original road. Uh, of particular interest is the fact that that petition was signed by seven of Highland's earliest pioneers, Daniel Dunham, Jesse Tenney, John C. Morse, Abner Hyde, Michael Beach, Jonathan Stratton, and Samuel Stratton, all of whom, by the way, own land along the originally proposed route. There were also quite a number of uh, Milford and uh, Hartland settlers who, who signed as well. Uh, sadly, Congress chose not to interfere, and so what today is Grand River Road uh, was instead built through and helped to stimulate uh, the growth of Novi, Wixom, New Hudson, and so on. Uh, I often wonder what our township would look like today uh, if that road had been built along the route that was originally requested and proposed. As far as state and territorial roads, uh, there were several of them that were authorized to be laid out and surveyed during the pioneer period, uh, but that doesn't mean they were actually built. Nearly, nearly every bill uh, that was passed authorizing a state or territorial road included language expressly forbidding any expenditure of state or territorial funds. Uh, it was instead up to the townships and villages through which such a road would pass to pay for its opening, as it was called. Uh, the only real benefit to having a state road designation uh, was that it put the choice of route in the hands of the commissioners, survey commission, um, and that prevented bickering between the various communities as to where the, the thing should run. Otherwise, you might have a route that comes here to the town border and then it starts out of nowhere a mile later as it goes through another township. Uh, in terms of state roads passing through Highland, uh, in 1833 the Territorial Council authorized a road from Pontiac uh, running thence on the most eligible route until it intersects the Grand River Road at or near the center of the county of Livingston, that is modern day Howell. Uh, two years later in 1835 the state legislature authorized another road starting at Pontiac, then passing the White Lake Settlement on its way to Alfred Williams on the Shiawassee River. Uh, that was current, or is current, White Lake uh, Road and Rose Center Road uh, following the old White Lake Trail. Uh, Alfred Williams, by the way, was a uh, fur trader that had a uh, trading post up there where the Indian reservation was. Finally, near the end of the pioneer period, there were two state roads authorized through Highland, both clearly following modern-day Milford Road. Uh, in 1849, three commissioners, including David Service of Highland, uh, were appointed to survey a road from Milford through Highland to Davisonville, or as we call it today, Davison. Uh, that's not to say that all or part of Milford Road had not already been established but by being designated a state road, uh, the act provided that all non-resident highway taxes, that is, taxes on property that people owned but they didn't live on, uh, collected within two miles of either side of that road were set aside for its uh, improvement. Uh, the following year, another act was passed for a road from Grand Blanc to Algerville, that's the old name for Holly, and then on through Rose to Milford. So again, that sounds like parts of modern-day Milford Road. Last but not least, townships themselves had the authority to lay out and establish roads uh, through a process I'll describe in, in just a bit. Uh, but as a general rule, township roads in this state try as much as possible to follow section lines. 
the reason being that uh, you don't want to put a road through the middle of somebody's farm. Um, but given the number of lakes and wetlands that we have here in Highland, that isn't often possible. Uh, for example, West Wardlow Road follows the section line between Milford and Hickory Ridge Road, but it can't go any further west because Dunham Lake's in the way. And there are numerous uh, other examples of that. Indeed, we have only one uh, section line road that passes completely through the township from one end to the other. Uh, that's Hickory Ridge Road, and even it has that little curve at the north end in order to make its way around that hill. Uh, all of the rest of them either don't go all the way through or are discontinuous uh, with a section of it shifted a half mile one way or the other. Uh, Wardlow again being another example of that. And of course we have roads like Milford, uh, Pettibone Lake, and Beaumont that just wander this way and that on no section line whatsoever. Um, now speaking of roads, one of the lesser known yet extremely valuable resources uh, available to local historians is a portfolio of maps of all of the Oakland County townships that was drawn in 1838 by a gentleman named Bella Hubbard. Uh, Hubbard was a true jack of all trades. He was a geologist, writer, historian, surveyor, lawyer, real estate dealer, lumberman, and civic leader. Uh, but at the time, he was serving as the assistant to Douglas Houghton, who had just been appointed Michigan's first state geologist. Uh, I'm not quite sure why these maps were prepared, but they're truly fascinating for anyone interested in local history. Here is Hubbard's map of Highland. And remember, this is 1838, so just five or six years after settlement. And let me just point out a couple of the uh, more interesting things. To get you oriented, here's White Lake, here's Dunham Lake, here's Lower Pettibone. Um, notice that Milford Road, or at least most of it, doesn't exist. If it did, it would be over here on the west side of Pettibone, coming up to Clyde, or what would become Clyde. Um, on the other hand, we have this road starting down here at the border with Milford and running diagonally uh, up north of Dunham Lake. And that is identified as a, uh, quote, state road not opened. Although I've read other accounts that show at least part of it was eventually built. Um, it seems to follow the general tract of the uh, Shiawassee Trail. And there's other evidence, as I said, to, to show that at least part of it was built. Down here along the Milford Highland border, you'll see another road indicated that says State Road Pontiac to Howell. So I suspect it's the one that was authorized in 1835. Um, the eastern portion of that is, of course, modern day Cooley Lake Road, but as we all know, Cooley Lake comes to an end and turns north and becomes. Pettibone, whereas that seems to show it continuing across uh, those wetlands and intersecting with what today is railroad. Uh, if it did continue all the way across, I have no idea how they got across that marsh. I've looked at a number of aerial photographs going back to the 40s to see if I could see some trace or remnant of it, and I don't. Um, but I haven't. Over here is um, Hickory Ridge, runs all the way up. Uh, what's interesting is it's labeled State Road Fentonville to Ann Arbor. Um, I've tried to find the piece of legislation that established that um, so far without success, although I suspect it was probably called something else in the original bill. Livingston Road is here, at least the portion, including the portion that's now in 59. But you'll notice it comes to a dead end at uh, what would be Pettibone Lake Road. Um, doesn't extend all the way to Duck Lake. Indeed, Duck Lake Road itself is not there. Uh, the other interesting thing is that, as you'll see, Pettibone Lake Road appears to continue north and then slowly curve around uh, what would be Jackson Boulevard today and over into 
White Lake. I suspect this may have been the route of that uh, Walled Lake Trail that was mentioned in that old history as a north south bypass. Uh, the only other major road shown is Clyde, which pretty much follows its current trajectory. Um, there's also a hint of a road that could be um, North Milford. And here, of course, is the old White Lake Trail and current Road Center Road. And that's pretty much it. Um, now, I could spend the rest of the evening talking about this. He's noted the location of settlers. He talks about the ground cover, very rolling, rough land, and so forth. But I want to move on and talk about how these paths and trails were used. Um, if you were to ask one of our early pioneers how they most often got from point A to point B, uh, chances are good they'd give you a wry smile and say that they, quote, rode shanks horses, close quote. Well, these are your shanks, and to ride shanks horses meant to walk. And when I say walking, uh, I'm not talking about ambling out to get the mail and I'm not even a, a stroll to the corner party store. These are walks that are measured in miles and hours, uh, not feet and minutes. <clears throat> to give just a couple of examples, James Rowe tells how his uncle, Sam Cheney, who lived, quote, just north of the village of Fenton, close quote, would walk 15 miles to Highland uh, to help the Rowe family during the harvest season. According to Rowe, quote, he would make the trip and be at our early breakfast table. So he would have to probably leave at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, when the week's work was over, he would return home the same way he came. Uh, Rowe also mentions a time when his cousin George, who was the son of Samuel, quote, carried a cowhide on his back in the winter from north of Fenton on his way to the tannery kept by Mr. Peters in Milford. When the hide was tanned and made ready, George came out and toted it home, all on foot. Uh, Janet McCall, whose family, as I mentioned, lived down here in the lower Pettibone Lake area, uh, at one point in her recollections, she says, we used to go way up to Brush Street. That was the old name for West Wardlow Road. She says there were orchards there that had more apples than we did, and they would have pairing bees. We would go way up there afoot. Now, depending just where on Brush Street she went, uh, that was at least a five-mile round trip, basically walking the Mackinac Bridge. Uh, elsewhere, she recalls, quote, we youngsters didn't think anything of going to Milford and back afoot, close quote. And that would be a six or seven mile round trip, depending upon whether she was going to the North Village or the South Village over the river. Uh, my favorite is, is an account by Mary Opino, who uh, grew up in Milford, just right about in there. And she says, quote, Mother would send George and myself to the store to buy some articles which she needed in her domestic duties. So by Milford, she meant the south village over the river where Ansley Arms had his first store. So roughly for her, about a two or three mile walk each way. Uh, and how did they get there? She says, quote, we used to cross the Huron River on an old log. This log had at some time previous to this been a very tall tree and when it fell, it fell across the river. In times of high water, the log was nearly covered with water, and at such times our footing was rather dangerous. Then we would take a pole in our hands and cross very cautiously. We generally succeeded well for such small children, but hardships made us wise." Close quote. I love that expression, hardships made us wise. Kind of sums up the whole pioneer experience. Needless to say, helicopter parenting was not a thing in those days. Uh, some other notable walkers were uh, the Reverend Morell. He was the first minister at West Highland. He is said to have walked 15 miles from Walled Lake to West Highland to keep his appointment. Uh, whether that was just one time or whether he did it regularly every other week isn't said. Uh, but the fact he gave up the appointment after six months kind of suggests he had to do it every other week. Um, 
Now, of course, if you needed to haul something bigger or heavier than what you could carry, uh, then you may have used a vehicle of some description. Uh, the simplest of these was something called a pung, P-U-N-G, or jumper. Uh, this was basically a very primitive sled made from two long poles, 12, 14, 16 feet long. Uh, you'd secure them in the back with some cross pieces, maybe put a board there for a seat, and as some accounts would say, an old um, box for a, a cargo bin. You'd then hang the front of the long poles off the ox yoke and you'd allow the rear ends to drag along the ground. So basically this was the pioneer version of the Indian travoy. Uh, this is one with some Plains Indians. Uh, needless to say that could be a rough ride uh, if you traveled over uneven ground which is why they called them a jumper. And over time, of course, the rear ends would wear down uh, from being dragged along the ground, but it was easy enough to make a new one. People really didn't care about that. Um, Janet McCall specifically mentions pungs by name, and she notes that they were used both winter and summer. Uh, the other vehicle which the lucky settlers had available to them uh, were farm wagons. Again, almost always drawn by oxen, as we discussed last week. Uh, these were not the huge Conestoga wagons that we used to haul uh, goods across the Appalachians. Those would have been way too big and heavy uh, to navigate our primitive road system. Instead, we're talking about a smaller, lighter uh, wagon that was nimble enough to maneuver around stumps, fallen branches, and other obstacles. Um, this one is on display up at Fayette State Park in the UP, so it's probably 30 years or so after the pioneer period, but it's not like there was model changeover every year. The design of these things was pretty consistent uh, throughout the 19th century. Uh, if you read enough of these old pioneer accounts, you get the sense uh, that anyone who was lucky enough to own one of these didn't fool with using it for casual transport. Uh, not only did it take time to hit your team up, but you wouldn't want to risk cracking a spoke or doing other damage uh, just to go visiting. You might use one to take the whole family to go to church or on some other outing, uh, but otherwise you walked. Instead, these wagons were primarily used to haul produce to market, take grain to be ground, uh, fetch a load of sawn lumber from the nearest mill, and any of those journeys would have been a real adventure. Uh, for one thing, those trips were both uh, lengthy, both in terms of distance and time. Uh, before we had our grist mill here at Spring Mills, you read about grain being taken to Dexter or Ann Arbor to be ground, uh, and either of those would have been a two or three day journey. And before you had a sawmill here, folks would travel as far as Fenton uh, to buy and haul back saw and lumber, which was another two or three day trip. James Rowe says in his recollections, quote, our nearest wheat market was Detroit, and it took three days to take a load in and return. Sometimes I would take part of the load with the oxen as far as New Hudson. At first the road was terrible. On the sand hill near Farmington, the farmers often doubled their teams. On one occasion, my brother Josiah was driving with part of a load of wheat, and it being a hot day, the oxen plunged into the Pettibone mill pond in spite of the efforts of the young driver. Father had a serious time getting that outfit out on terra firma, close quote. Um, by the way, the poor condition of Grand River Road uh, including its notorious Sand Hill, is mentioned in dozens of Oakland County pioneer histories. Um, P.A. Whistley, who was a Milford settler, described it this way. He says, in the early days, all the market we had for Milford and adjoining towns was Detroit by way of the Grand River Turnpike and such a road. We had the long causeway on the line between South Lyon or Lyon Township and Novi. Uh, a mile and eight rods long, built from tamarack logs from one half to two feet in diameter, not covered at all, so a very primitive corduroy road. 
you would just put on 10 or 12 barrels of flour on the end of your wagon box, put a sheepskin on the head of your lead ox, and drive your team over those logs more than a mile. You might think it was fun, but the fun didn't come in just then. The fun commenced when you got beyond the sand hill where there was no bottom to the road. I've been four days going and coming." Close quote. So I guess you could say that the need to fix the damn roads is nothing new in this state. Now, there were a lot of other people that used these roads and trails besides the Indians and the ordinary settlers. Uh, one group, as I mentioned last week, were area doctors who would often travel for miles to treat patients in other townships. Uh, another group were the ministers of various faiths, such as Methodist circuit riders. Uh, for the moment, though, I'd like to briefly talk about post riders and others involved in the delivery of mail, since postal service, like roads, uh, can be thought of as part of the community's infrastructure. Uh, if you were one of Highland's earliest settlers, sending or receiving a letter was no easy task. Uh, initially, you had to go all the way to Pontiac. Uh, later on, you could go to Walled Lake. Uh, but neither journey was all that easy. To get to Pontiac, for example, you either had to go southeast along the Shirewassee Trail to Walled Lake, then turn northeast on what is now Pontiac Trail, or you had to cut across country diagonally, get up into uh, the northeast part of the township, and get your bearings on the White Lake Trail and head east. In fact, uh, as we'll discuss in a moment, the lack of any direct route to Pontiac was one of the major arguments that the early settlers made for organizing Highland as a separate township, because up until that time, uh, we were part of Pontiac Township. All of that changed in terms of postal service, however, in uh, March 16, 1835, when a new post office in Highland was created and Jonathan F. Stratton was appointed postmaster, 16 March 1835. Uh, ironically, Stratton was appointed the day before Governor Mason signed the act authorizing creation of the township itself. So you could say that we had a Highland post office before we had an official Highland Township. Now Stratton was in many ways um, one of Highland's most important, if unsung, early settlers. He had got his education in surveying and civil engineering while working on the Erie Canal. And after he came here to Michigan, he settled in Ann Arbor ended up being the county surveyor for both Washtenaw and Jackson counties. He was appointed to serve on any number of uh, these commissions to lay out territorial roads. He drew up the initial plat for the city of Jackson and clearly had friends in high places as far as Michigan's territorial government was concerned. Uh, and his appointment as Highland's first postmaster is evidence of that. During most of the 19th century, uh, both the creation of new post offices and the choice of postmaster was handled by the first or second assistant postmaster in Washington. Uh, this process was highly politicized, uh, with appointments being given to supporters of the party then in office, which at this time were Jacksonian Democrats. Uh, so the fact that Highland his first post office was established so quickly. Notice it's more than a year than Aaron Phelps was appointed uh, first postmaster in Milford. Shows that Stratton had some connections uh, which were not only very useful to him personally, but also of a benefit to his, his fellow settlers. Now his postal duties would have undoubtedly been handled in his home, uh, which was located south of Highland Station near the uh, entrance to Presswick. Uh, here he would have received and collected postage for outgoing mail and held the incoming mail until some settler made his way there to call for it. Uh, notice that the record of his appointment has the word private here next to it. 
what that meant is he had to make his own arrangements to get the mail from some other established post office and bring it out here. Um, that didn't last long, however, because in September of 1835, just a, a few months afterwards, the U.S. Post Office placed a notice in the Detroit Free Press soliciting bids for a contract uh, to carry the mails on a special route, Highland to be supplied from Walled Lake, nine miles, once a week. Stratton continued as postmaster until February of 1837, and that's when Enos Leek, who was his brother-in-law, took over. Uh, Enos was living at the time in the Stratton home, so it likely didn't involve any change of location. Leek, in turn, continued to serve as postmaster until May of 1844, when he was replaced by George Showerman, and the post office was relocated to the village that had begun to spring up uh, at Highland Corners, or what we today call West Highland. So as a result, West Highland uh, was officially known as Highland Post Office, or simply Highland, uh, for the next 30 years. Uh, it wasn't until the railroad went through that what we think of as Highland um, was established. Now, during this period from 1835 onward up to the end of the pioneer period, uh, we became part of several longer, more complex mail routes that linked us with a lot of other towns. Uh, in 1842, there was a contract awarded to carry mail, quote, from Pontiac by Waterford Center, Commerce, Milford, Highland, Heartland, and Osceola to Howell, 38 miles and back, once a week. Uh, by 1851, this same mail route was traveled six days a week. Three days going out, three times a week, three days coming back. What's interesting is you were supposed to leave Pontiac at 6 a.m. on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays and beat a howl by 9 p.m., 41 miles in one day. Now, whether that was the same horse and rider or whether hopefully they switched off Midway, I'm, I'm not sure, but that would have been up to the person who was awarded the contract. Anyway, it was a grueling schedule. Uh, there was likewise a north-south route that was established by Congress in 1850 to carry the mail on Friday from Grand Blanc to Holly, Rose, White Lake, Highland, ending up in Kensington. Uh, that was a 35-mile trip uh, on Fridays and then the same route going back uh, on Saturday. So by the end of the pioneer period, uh, just 20 years after settlement had begun, uh, folks here were able to send and receive mail on a more or less daily basis, uh, notwithstanding roads that I suspect were still quite bad in places. Uh, personally, I find that rather impressive. Uh, it shows not only how important postal service was, because after all it was really the only way you had communication with the outside world, uh, but it's also indicative of the support which the post office enjoyed uh, throughout the nation as a whole. Remember that for most people during this period, the post office was the face of the federal government. Uh, we didn't have an income tax, we didn't have an IRS, uh, there weren't all these other federal agencies that were intruding in our daily lives. So unless you were in the military, and you had a fairly small army, um, or you wanted to go and buy more land at the government land office, uh, the only time most Americans had any contact with the federal government was via the post office. Uh, indeed, as one of my old history professors pointed out, prior to the Civil War, the post office might be the only place where people ever saw an American flag. Think about that. Today, I suspect there are more flags at our combined auto dealerships here in town than there were in the whole state back in 1850. Uh, so the federal government had a, a very limited role. Otherwise, it was your state and, more importantly, your local government that played the biggest role in people's day-to-day -day lives. So with that, let's turn our attention to township <coughs> government. Um, 
Under the Northwest Ordinance of 1783, the power to create new townships was initially invested in the territorial governor. Uh, in 1825, however, that power was transferred to the Legislative Council, which was the name for Michigan's territorial legislature. Uh, since members of the council were themselves appointees of the president, however, they were largely immune from political pressure. Uh, but in 1827, Congress passed yet another law providing for the direct election of council members. And that opened the floodgates uh, to the formation of new townships. Indeed, if you look at the journals of the council, and they're all, <coughs> all been scanned by Google and are online, uh, from 1827 onward, you will find an ever-growing list of petitions uh, by early pioneers all across the state asking for their community to uh, <coughs> split off from whatever larger township it was then part of and allowed to organize as a self-governing township of its own. So in December of 1834, uh, 15 of Highland's early settlers submitted their own petition to the Territorial Council, and here it is. Uh, still exists up in our state archives. And since the handwriting is pretty hard to decipher, let me just read it out loud. To the Honorable, the Governor and Legislative Council of the Territory of Michigan, we, the undersigned inhabitants of Township 3 North of Range 7 East, would respectfully represent that we are situated in the district of country now subject to the town of Pontiac that we suffer many inconveniences from our remote situation from the place of doing town business. The township east of us, namely Township 3 North Range 8 East, White Lake. Not having any inhabitants or road, we have little or no communication in the direction of Pontiac. We would therefore petition your honorable body to set us off and organize us as a separate town by the name of Highland the first town meeting to be held at the schoolhouse on the farm of Jesse Tenney, and that Jonathan F. Stratton be appointed Justice of the Peace. This year, petitioners do sincerely pray. Dated Township 3 North, Range 11 East, December 19, 1834. And it's signed by 15 different people, Michael Beach, Jesse Tenney, Robert Finley, Daniel Dunham, Rufus Tenney, Stephen Armstrong, Abner Hyde, Mindrick Gardner, Peter McPherson, Duncan McCall, Theron Armstrong, Alexander Finley, Joseph Becker, Jephtha Coburn, and Noah P. Morse. So when we talk about Founders Day, which is coming up here in another couple of weeks, uh, I like to think it's these 15 signers uh, plus Stratton who we are honoring. Now that petition is interesting in a number of different ways, so let me spend a little bit of time on it. First, notice how early it came in our history. Uh, barely two years after settlement had started. Second, it's clear that the settlers had picked the name Highland for themselves. Uh, there are other petitions filed during this period that simply say, basically, split us off and you give us a name, we don't care. Uh, in our case, however, it not only seems that we picked the name, but that we were already using it. Uh, remember how I said that Stratton was appointed postmaster of Highland even before the governor uh, signed the act organizing this. Well, you know, that process uh, to get appointed wouldn't have happened overnight. There had to be mail going back and forth to Washington. Um, so it seems likely that Stratton applied for his position as postmaster and passed along the desired name around the same time that this uh, petition was being circulated. As for who came up with the name, my best guess, and I will freely confess it's only a guess, is that it was either Stratton or Beach or both. Uh, both men were surveyors, so they would have readily understood that this area contains some of the highest land in terms of our elevation above sea level of any that had been settled up until that time. Uh, it's also worth noting that Stratton uh, was no stranger to naming things. He's the one who suggested the name Jacksonboro for what is now uh, Jackson, Michigan. He named Whitmore Lake 
uh, for the companion that he had with him when he surveyed that area. Uh, as far as Beach's involvement, uh, his signature is on the right side there, one line above everybody else's. Uh, and as embarrassing as it is to admit, the sloppy handwriting, faulty grammar, and bad spelling, such as body, got two Bs in it, uh, does match some other examples that I have of, of his writing. Another thing to notice is the rationale given for wanting to separate from Pontiac. Namely, there was no good way to get there. Um, as I said this evening, there was no direct east-west road. Uh, White Lake was just starting to be settled. So that was a big factor. Last, let me call your attention to this rather curious notation in brackets beside the name of Stephen Armstrong. And what that reads is, quote, to be called, with the C-A-L on one line and the L-E-D on the other, to be called the town of Bohe, close quote. Mm -hmm. Now, what in the world does that mean? Uh, I struggled with that for a while. Bohe is actually the name for a type of Indian tea, of all things. But then I started digging a little deeper, and I realized that Stephen Armstrong had, at, by this time, owned some 400 acres of land down in Section 33, uh, including much of the land around Milford High School. And he also owned a, another couple hundred over the border in Milford. And as you'll remember from those maps that I showed you earlier, it's that area where all of these trails and roads are sort of crisscrossing and intersecting. And it was also not too far from where talk was about a canal running. Uh, in other words, it would have been a great location to plant a new town. And I suspect that he was among the hundreds of landowners uh, that were thinking about making their fortune by planting a town and, and selling lots. And so either he or someone else added that notation as a further incentive to the uh, Territorial Council. Yes, ma'am? What is that notation next to Armstrong? Does that say White Lake? No. I can't read it. 2-B-C-A-L. To be what? 2-B-T-O-B-E-C-A-L hyphen we ran out of room. L E D called. Oh, to be called. To be called the town of Bohe. Bohe? Bohe. B O H E A. Okay. It is the name of a type of uh, Asian tea. So he wanted this to be called. No, Bohe. he was he was planning, I suspect, to set up a village. Oh. And he was going to call it Bohe. Right? Okay. That name had a certain cachet because it was a, a high end tea, but you like building a town today and calling it Tiffany. Okay? Okay. And he owned all this property down where all these trails are coming together, which made a perfect site. It's and level. Name it and he, say, he said, wait, I'm not just Stephen Armstrong, I'm Stephen Armstrong real estate magnet who is going to create this town, which is why I don't want to be a part of Pontiac. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the logic in a nutshell. Is that Armstrong Millworks connected with him? Uh, distantly, no. not really. No. Okay, that's a different, a different branch. I think if you go back a couple hundred years, it may, but certainly not immediate. Anyway, we've got this petition. Um, to make a long story short, it was presented to the Legislative Council in January of 1835. They immediately sent it to their Committee on Territorial Affairs. A week later, they report out a favorable bill. Uh, at that time, you had three votes before a bill became law. We had the first two. Before we could get to the third vote, uh, the President of the Council said, look, I've got 20 of these bills pending from all over the state. Sent them all back to committee, had them all consolidated into this huge um, omnibus bill, and that wasn't passed until February 11th. Uh, once it was passed, ordinarily the governor had his office in the Capitol building, so they would walk it across the hall, and he'd sign it either that day or the next. 
Uh, as it turns out, however, back in February of 1835, Governor Mason was running around calling out the militia and otherwise preparing for the Toledo War. So he didn't get around to signing it until March 17th. Uh, that was cutting things pretty close because the legislation itself required us to hold our first uh, township meeting on April 6th, which was 19 days away. Uh, but everything worked out. We had our first township meeting as scheduled, and Highland's existence as a separate township became an established fact. How many of you were faithful viewers of Gilmore Girls? Anybody? Anybody want to confess to watching Gilmore Girls? All right, I got one. Anyway, if, if you did, you may recall episodes where the residents of the fictional village of Stars Hollow all got together in the town hall and they would debate and make motions and vote. Uh, it was a form of government that political scientists called direct democracy. In Michigan, many of our townships, in fact, all of our townships initially operated that way. Uh, many of them still do in smaller uh, rural areas. Uh, Highland used to be a common law township like that, I think up until the late 70s or early 80s when we became a charter township. Uh, so instead of popular vote, we now vote for representatives who sit on, on the board and we let them make the policy. Uh, back in 1835, township government worked like this. Every spring, you had an annual town meeting at which any male freeholder could appear, propose a motion, run for office, vote, etc. cetera. Uh, those officers included the supervisor who was responsible for implementing any policies adopted at the meeting. Uh, he was also charged with holding and dispersing township funds and he represented Highland on the Oakland County Board of Supervisors which was the governing body for the county as a whole. You also had a clerk who was responsible for keeping the records and also for swearing in uh, the various officers. So to that extent, not all that different than it is today. Uh, but there were a number of other offices uh, that don't exist anymore. One of these was Constable. Uh, he was the principal peace officer in the township. He functioned much like a modern-day deputy sheriff would. He was specifically charged with maintaining order at township meetings, as well as serving writs and other legal process. Uh, where taxes or fines went unpaid, he was empowered to seize land or property, advertise it for sale, and use the proceeds to satisfy the, the debt or the fine. You also had a collector whose job was to go around and collect everybody's property taxes every year. Um, given that both the constable and the collector were required by law to post a substantial bond, uh, it was fairly common in the early days for the same person to hold both offices. Assessors were, as the name implies, responsible for fixing the value of the settler's land and goods for tax purposes. Uh, because of that, it could be a rather thankless job. Uh, so it required not only a working knowledge of, of local real estate values, but also a reputation for, for simple honesty and fairness. Commissioners of highways were charged with planning and supervising township roads. Uh, their powers included altering the routes of existing roads to make them more convenient and laying out new roads as the need arose. One specific duty was to, quote, cause guideposts with proper devices and descriptions to be erected at the intersection of all the post roads in this territory, close quote. They were further charged with dividing the township into local road districts and ensuring that the overseers of highways chosen for those districts performed their duties. Now, if you think there is too much government intrusion in people's lives today, uh, be glad you didn't live back here in 1835, since the next couple of offices that I'm going to describe could be quite intrusive. As I said, the township was divided into different road districts, each one entrusted to an overseer of highways. 
Now these were folks that were more directly involved with the actual construction, maintenance, and repair of the road system. And one of their chief responsibilities uh, was to maintain a list of all the able-bodied men within their district who were capable of working on the roads. And then the overseer would periodically post a notice and announce that such and such work was needed on a given stretch of road. And all of the men on that list were not only expected, but required to show up and work. And if they didn't or couldn't show up, they either had to furnish a substitute or they had to pay a fine of 62 and one half cents a day for each day that they missed. Now, can you imagine that happening today? Okay. I mean, I have this delightful mental image. I'm driving through the construction zone on M59, and there's my neighbor from Preswick on the bulldozer, and my other neighbor from Timber Ridge on the, on the grader. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, the closest thing we have to that kind of compulsory civic service today is either the draft, which we don't have anymore, or being called for jury duty. And think of the lengths that some people will go to to avoid even that. Um, Highland's first overseers of highways were also uh, given the duties of fence viewers within their respective districts. And a fence viewer's job basically entailed making sure that each farmer maintained the fences needed uh, to confine his livestock. So if your cow got loose, or horse, and it raided the neighbor's garden, um, you could call in the fence viewer to assess the damages and decide whether inadequate fencing was to blame, and if so, he would charge whatever amount he thought fair. Fence viewers were also obligated to make sure that neighbors paid their fair share for building and maintaining a common fence. Uh, so if I settled on my piece of property first and I built a nice long fence along one edge of it and a year or so later you move in next door and you have the advantage of using my fence, you don't have to build your own, I can call the fence viewer, he'll look at how long it is, how well it's built, what it would cost to build, and my neighbor would, new neighbor would now owe me half the value of that fence. Um, Commissioners of Common Schools was another office. They were charged primarily for dividing the township up into appropriate school districts, uh, each of which would there be, thereafter be governed by its own elected board of directors. Uh, should circumstances warrant, the commissioners of adjoining townships could also agree to establish so-called fractional districts. Uh, what that meant was you got a school district that actually straddled the border. The old Beaumont School up at Duck Lake in Jackson was a fractional district school because it included parts of White Lake as well as parts of Highland. Um, the other thing that commissioners were charged with was the use of so-called Section 16 land. Originally the federal government had this brilliant idea that Section 16 in every township would be set aside for educational purposes. And the way it was supposed to work is that the local school commissioners would rent that land out uh, and use the proceeds to uh, help defray the educational costs. That system never worked very well. By the 1850s, the federal government had turned it, all that Section 16 land over to the states, and Michigan said, the heck with it, we're going to sell it uh, and let the proceeds go to the um, school districts, and it'll be a one-shot deal. The last major township office were the overseers of the poor. Um, they were charged with supervising the care of a township's less fortunate residents. If a poor or disabled person were to apply for relief, the overseer and the justice of the peace would hold an inquiry uh, to determine whether and if so how much support should be given. Overseers of the poor were likewise authorized to bind out needy miners as an apprentice. They could seize the land and chattels of, quote, absconding husbands, close quote, and use the proceeds to pay his wife or children. The office had a darker side 
side. The office had a darker side in that overseers of the poor were also charged with the examination of strangers. That is to say, uh, vagrants and transients who might become a burden on the finances of the township. If such persons should not be able to show that they had established legal residence by buying some property here, they could be taken into custody and the constable would physically return them to whatever other township they had wandered away from. Uh, needless to say, there were a lot of battles where Township A would send the guy back to B, B said no, he belongs over here, and these people were shuttled all the way around. Um, the most fascinating thing about early township government, however, is this. If your fellow citizens deemed you deserving of a particular office, and they duly elected you as such, you could not refuse the honor. Michigan law at the time said that if any person hereafter chosen or appointed supervisor, township clerk, assessor, collector, commissioner of highways, director of the poor, or constable, as a force shall refuse to take upon him or to serve in such office, then, and in every such case, every person so neglecting or refusing shall forfeit to the people of the county the sum of $15. And the county prosecutors were specifically directed by that statute to prosecute you for that penalty. Um, if you were one of the lesser offices, overseer of the highway or fence viewers, your penalty was a little less. It was only $5. The only exception to this mandatory civic service was, quote, any person of any religious denomination to act as an assessor or collector who shall affirm that he hath conscientious scruples about executing the duties of such office, close quote. Anybody think of why that might be? Well, if you recall your New Testament, it has some very nasty things to say about publicans and tax collectors. So if you took your Bible literally, you might very well have a conscientious objection to being a tax collector. And that's why that exception was there. The irony, of course, is that today people send gobs of money <coughs> to get elected. <laughs> right? So the idea that you could be fined for not serving seems totally strange to us. Uh, but during the pioneer period, this mandatory service uh, had both a practical and a very symbolic function. Given the limited pool of inhabitants on which, to draw, on which we could draw, uh, the refusal of an otherwise qualified person to fulfill his civic duty only increased the burden uh, on all of his neighbors. And we see that in the first township meeting here in Highland where a number of the candidates for office were elected to two and in some cases three different offices simultaneously. There just weren't enough folks to go around. Um, perhaps more importantly, this mandatory service reinforced the idea that settlement was a communal enterprise. This is really no different than the expectation that if I build a cabin you're going to come out and help me or that everyone should get together and come out and build the road. Today we view government as a service and we're the retail customer. Uh, back then government was perceived as a process in which we were active participants. So it's a totally different orientation. Um, now throughout this series, both last week and again here, I've tried to get across this idea of community building and We've talked about uh, how settlers were related to one another, old friends and neighbors, uh, sharing ox teams, working on the roads, just now serving in township office. There were other ways, however, in which this sense of community was both created and reinforced, one of which was the church. Uh, as I mentioned last week, for example, West Highland Baptist Church got its start even before the township was organized, and it played a key role in developing uh, the community for decades afterwards. Uh, when the time came to build our first school here in town, the church and the school went halves so that they could have a larger structure that could be used as a school during the week and as a place to hold services on Sunday. 
It was likewise members of that church who laid out our first real cemetery at West Highland, and the church itself would take it over a year or two later and manage it uh, for a good while after. Methodists had an early presence in the township. Um, how many are Methodists? But the nature of 19th century Methodism makes it hard to say exactly when the first Methodist church was established. Um, back in the 19th century, individual Methodists in a given area, uh, typically no more than a dozen, might come together in what was known as a class, uh, organized under the leadership of a lay class leader. Uh, they'd meet weekly, they might have some prayers and Bible readings, uh, but it was not a formal worship service in the sense we know it today. Uh, as a layman, the class leader could neither administer the sacraments nor technically could he uh, preach or exhort. Uh, for those functions, the local class remained wholly dependent on the circuit writer coming through. Um, as classes grew in size, however, they would be merged and organized into a larger society, which was the traditional Methodist name for what today we call a local church. Uh, societies were both more structured and formal, they could own land, they were incorporated under their state law, and they usually would end up building a dedicated house of worship. Uh, initially, they might be served by a licensed lay preacher, uh, still relying on the circuit writer to do the sacraments. Uh, but in time, as they grew larger, an ordained elder might be assigned as a full-time or shared uh, minister. Uh, one old history dates the advent of Methodism here uh, to 1835. I think that's a bit early because at least three of the members named uh, didn't take up land in the area until mid-1836. Whatever the precise date, however, that class grew to the point where in 1850 it organized into a society or church, and that first Methodist church initially met in a school up on Hickory Ridge Road near Clyde, some, Clyde Road. Uh, some years later they then built an actual church building on Clyde Road uh, just west of Hickory Ridge Road. For me, though, I think the most fascinating if largely unknown fact about Highland's early religious life was the existence of a group of folks who belonged to the Church of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and they were located in the far southeast part of town where Highland, Milford, uh, White Lake, and Commerce all come together. There are many people today who are surprised to realize what an important role um, Michigan played in early Mormon church history. But as it turns out, Joseph Smith's mother, uh, Lucy Mack Smith, was the younger sister of Colonel Stephen Mack. Uh, he's the one who Mack Avenue is named after in Detroit, and he is the one who uh, went on to found the Pontiac Company and established the village of Pontiac. Colonel Mack had died in 1826 uh, but some years later, one of his daughters, uh, Elmira, went to visit her Smith relatives, and she was converted and baptized uh, by Joseph Smith. Then in 1831, Mother Smith herself came to Pontiac with, uh, to visit the colonel's widow and children. Uh, she was accompanied by three Mormon missionaries, and they began uh, seeking converts. They were followed the next year, 1832, by Jared Carter, who was one of Joseph Smith's closest associates. And they succeeded in converting quite a number of settlers in the Pontiac and Waterford area, uh, including Nahum Curtis, who soon became the first man to purchase land here in Highland down in Section 36, basically Cooley Lake and Duck Lake Road area. Um, his brother, Jeremiah, also bought land in this area in Commerce, Kitty Corner, uh, across the boundary. And they had rather large families, and it appears they may have also played host uh, to some other uh, recent converts, because that area where Highland, Milford, Commerce all come together uh, was known for quite a while as the Mormon settlement. 
It's mentioned in an 1877 history of commerce as, as by that phrase. John K. Reed, who was himself an early Milford settler, uh, says in his reminiscences that, quote, he had heard people tell about a Mormon settlement that was northeast of Milford, and there was some excitement about it once, close quote. Uh, there's also an interesting story in an old history of Tyrone, Livingston County, about how the first cabin in that township uh, was built near some wetlands that provided marsh hay for winter grazing. And I'll quote now. In Milford, Oakland County was a Mormon settlement, and they had quite a large lot of cattle to provide for. So in the fall of 1833, they sent a drove of cattle to this locality in charge of two brothers named Teeple and their families. They built a small log house near the north line of the section and lived there during that winter, close quote. Uh, those brothers, by the way, were Jacob and Henry Teeples. The family name actually has an S at the end. Uh, they were early Highland settlers and they owned land immediately north of the Curtis piece. Um, sad to say, the existence of this Mormon settlement seems to have been more divisive than unifying. Uh, to use John K. Reed's phrase, there was some excitement about it. As it turned out, however, the thing was short-lived. Uh, in 1833 and 34, there had been some violent clashes out in Missouri between church members and other settlers. Uh, Joseph Smith responded by sending reinforcements from Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Uh, among those who went were two of Nahum Curtis's sons, followed a year or so later by Nahum himself, along with his brother Jeremiah and the rest of the family, uh, after which the settlement was abandoned and the excitement uh, died down. Now with that background, mm -hmm. let me toss in one more interesting fact. At Highland's first town meeting, April 1835, the assembled settlers elected Nahum Curtis to be overseer of the poor. Now there are two ways to look at that. On the one hand, I'd like to think that Nahum's fellow pioneers were able to put aside uh, any negative feelings they might have had toward his faith and simply decided he was the best man for the job, either despite or because of his religious beliefs. There is, however, a more cynical way to view that election. Remember that Curtis lived down in the far southeast part of the township. As such, he would have been five or six miles away from the majority of the settlers, either in the Tenney settlement or up by White Lake. But of course, under that law I mentioned earlier, poor Nahum couldn't refuse to serve, despite the distances involved, because of the sizable fine. So a cynic might argue that far from being an honor, his election was maybe a nudge to encourage him to move on, as he soon did. Uh, at this point, of course, it's impossible to say which of those uh, was the reason, but it is interesting to ponder. Who can tell me who that gentleman is? Anyone? Jenny Appleseed. Ah, very, very good. Here I was thinking I might have to use this one. Mm -hmm. It's Johnny Appleseed, real name John Chapman, in many People today know him only by reason of that Disney cartoon. Very interesting character. You could devote a whole lecture to him in his own right. The point I want to make is that Chapman grew apples from seed. And an apple grown from seed rarely breeds true. Occasionally you'll get one that's a good eating apple, but most bear what were called spitters, because that's what you did if you tried to eat one. Uh, Thoreau once observed that a wild apple like that was, quote, sour enough to set a squirrel's teeth on edge and make a jay scream, close quote. <laughs> but of course, Chapman isn't raising apples to be eaten. He's raising them so that the settlers could make cider. And when I say cider, I'm not talking about that cloyingly sweet stuff you get at Deals or at Spicer's. May I have your attention, please? The library is now closed, and we will reopen tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you. I'm talking about the good stuff. 
after it has sat and fermented. Because when folks used the term cider in the 19th century, it was always the fermented hard variety. Indeed, to this day, most major dictionaries list fermented apple juice as the primary meaning of cider. The sweet stuff that we drink is the secondary definition, quote, chiefly American. Um, it isn't until the development of refrigeration and pasteurization in the late 1800s that cider as we know it today became the norm. So why is cider so important? First, it is a much healthier drink than water from a lake or even a well. No bugs, no frogs, most of the microbes have been killed off by the alcohol. Secondly, it's surprisingly nutritious. Uh, lots of carbs, vitamin C that helps prevent scurvy. Pioneers wouldn't know that, of course, but they instinctively realized that it was somehow beneficial. Cider also kept well. After all, fermentation is just another means of food preservation. Uh, you could put apples in a root cellar or a barrel in the fall, but by February they would probably be all mush. Uh, a barrel of cider could last all winter, provided you didn't drink it first. And unlike beers or ales, which was another common everyday drink, cider had the advantage that there's no brewing. There's no mash, there's no heating. You just squeeze the apples and put them in a jug or a barrel and nature does its thing. So cider was everywhere and everybody drank it, man, woman, and child. There were some, of course, as we'll talk in a second, who, who started thinking of it as a gateway drink. Um, and I'm sure there were folks who abused it, for, but for most it was no more than what today we might do with having a, a beer with a pizza or a nice glass of wine with a, with a nice dinner. Um, up until the early 1900s, more apples were used to make hard cider than were eaten. And when prohibition came in, uh, literally thousands upon thousands of 19th century apple orchards, including many of them that Johnny Appleseed himself had planted, were literally cut down because the apples that they produced were useless for anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Highland, by the way, our Johnny Appleseed was Jonathan Stratton. Uh, he planted our first orchard using seedlings that he had brought with him from Ann Arbor in 1834. Now, of course, there was the hard stuff as well. And while a growing number of settlers condemned its use, sharing a jug seems to have done as much to help foster a sense of community as any of the other factors that I've mentioned. Simply put, whiskey was a social lubricant that allowed otherwise sober and often somber men to let their hair down, kick back, and enjoy a brief respite from the drudgery of pioneer life. In some cases, sharing a jug was an almost indispensable ritual, such as during a cabin raising. Uh, John K. Reed of Milford, for example, recalls a cabin raising this way. He says, quote, they had a five-gallon jug of whiskey. After the frame was up and the logs were up, the men would all have a drink, and then they'd name the new log house and throw the jug over the house. But the jug was always empty then, close quote. <laughs> kind of like christening a ship, right? Uh, we also have this rather insightful account of the time that Jesse Seeley and Cornelius Wyckoff built their cabins on the east side of White Lake, 1833. Quote, as an article not to be dispensed with on such occasions, whiskey had flowed freely at the raising, and some of the men were somewhat under its influence. This was considered as no disgrace, however, as everybody expected it at such gatherings, close quote. And I could give you dozens of examples from all over the state uh, of this kind of thing happening. Uh, there are also some rather amusing stories about the times that the occasional temperance-minded settler would try to raise a cabin without furnishing whiskey. Uh, in one case, this only served to uh, enhance the fun because his neighbors brought a jug with them and hid it out in the bushes and would race out there to take a swig in secret. A couple other times 
the neighbors literally said, we aren't coming. They boycotted it, uh, forcing the poor temperance-minded settler to have to send word out throughout the whole county for any other temperance-minded people out there to come help him raise his cabin. Elections were another occasion where liquor flowed freely. Uh, an old history of Heartland noted that during town meetings, quote, liquor was freely dispensed. After canvassing the ballots, the elected candidates were accustomed to exercise their hospitality, and a free and easy time was the inevitable result. Some of the early pioneers who still survive having a vivid recollection of the condition in which they sought their homes after these election revels, close quote. Now in that regard, the minutes of our first town meeting are kind of interesting. As you heard, the act authorizing our first town meeting said you're going to hold it in the schoolhouse on Jesse Tenney's farm. Uh, but as I said earlier, that schoolhouse also served on Sundays as the West Highland Baptist Church. Anyway, the minutes indicate that the settlers all get together for that first town meeting at the school. They elect a moderator or chairman to preside over the meeting and immediately someone, doesn't say who, makes a motion to adjourn the meeting and reconvene at the Noah P. Morse farm. And that was a good <coughs> half mile or more away. Now, there's no explanation for that in the minutes. Why would you leave this nice, comfortable schoolhouse church sanctuary and trudge up a half mile to go to the farm? Um, I've often wondered, however, whether they felt that maybe Mr. Morse's farm was a more suitable location to enjoy a swig or two as opposed to the sanctity of a school and church. Um, now, of course, not everybody approved of alcohol. You heard earlier uh, James Rowe and remembered how his father, Squire Rowe, accidentally on purpose tipped over the whiskey jug. Uh, and even before that incident, there was actually a very serious temperance movement here in the township. In 1837, for example, an unnamed Highland clergyman, uh, who I suspect was perhaps Thomas Baker, uh, wrote to the Journal of the American Temperance Union, noting that 120 residents had thus far signed a teetotal pledge, uh, and local farmers were promising not to sell their grain to the distiller. Now, since the 1830 census gives our population, 1837 census gives our population is 440, and assuming some of those are, are young children, um, those 120 signatures would be maybe 40, 50 percent of the adult population. Uh, by the way, the word teetotal has nothing to do with tea. It's spelled T-E-E. -E. Um, the story goes that a British temperance leader was giving a speech in which he promised to be totally abstinent, and since he had a stutter, it came out as teetotal, and everybody thought that was really great, and so the word teetotal became the name for the movement. That's the story. Anyway, for those Highland residents who still enjoyed taking a nip, no doubt they raised a toast when Zenas Phelps opened our first tavern at West Highland around 1840. Uh, back then, of course, a tavern was much more than simply a place to take a drink. Uh, in many ways, a tavern was a state-licensed, state-regulated rest stop or a travel center. A uh, tavern keeper needed a license from the township, needed to post a sign with his name on it, and he needed, quote, to be furnished with suitable provisions and lodgings for strangers and travelers, and with stable room, hay, and provender for horses and cattle, close quote. As far as serving liquor went, tavern owners were prohibited from serving Indians, common drunkards, and known spendthrifts. On the other hand, he could serve hard spirits to a miner, provided that the miner was a bona fide traveler on the highways. The theory being, I guess, if you're trudging 10 or 15 miles in the snow, and well, not even a youngster might need a nip. Um, let me turn now to pioneer recreations and pastimes, just very briefly. Uh, James D. Rowe tells us that whenever some chore around the farm became boring or fatiguing, his father would say, quote, call it play and go at it. 
close quote. And that ethic of turning work into play pretty much sums up pioneer recreation. Uh, I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes where it says, nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, and that was their philosophy. Need to build a cabin or a barn? Fine, invite the neighbors, give them a good meal, maybe a shot of whiskey or cider to liven up the atmosphere and go at it. Uh, need to cut and dry apples for winter? Invite the other farm wives over for a bee, turn it into a social occasion. Uh, Janet McCall remembers that. Hunting down the occasional bear uh, was as much a recreation as it was an effort to eliminate a perceived threat. Uh, James Rowe remembers being in school when news came of a bear on the Dunham farm. The whole school let out. Everybody ran up to Dunham Lake to watch them hunt the bear. Even church going was a form of recreation. Uh, in a rather revealing passage, Alice McKeever of Milford says that, quote, nearly everybody went to meeting in those days. One reason might be there was no other place to go, close quote. In that regard, Janet McCall remembered a time when, quote, we went to church in Stratton's barn and some mischievous, mischievous boys fixed a haymow so that when a fellow stepped on it, he would go down. And they did, too, close quote. About the only recreation that was not associated with some form of work uh, was the 4th of July. And that was truly a holiday. Um, and if you didn't have fireworks, you would sometimes do what was called blowing the anvil. You'd take one anvil, turn it upside down, fill the hollow spot in the base with gunpowder, set another anvil on top of it, light the fuse, run like the Dickens, and when it went off, it would blow it 20 feet in the air, and both anvils would ring like a bell. With that, let me conclude this evening with a few marks on what I'm going to call uh, community identity. In other words, the group or area uh, the settlers felt that they belonged to. Um, most of us think of anyone living in Detroit as a Detroiter. But if you are a Detroiter, you know that you make a distinction between East Siders and West Siders, depending upon which side of Woodward Avenue you're on. Uh, in Milford, a uh, long-time resident still uh, distinguished between South Siders and North Siders, depending on which side of the rivers you're on. Simply put, our sense of place, uh, the limits of what we think of as our community, do not depend on political boundaries as much as they do on things such as rivers, roads, railroads, or where a given neighborhood got its start. And the same was true, apparently, in the pioneer period. Uh, indeed, up until the railroad went through in 1871, there were essentially two highlands uh, located in opposite corners of the township. The first down here in the southwest, of course, uh, grew out of the old Tenney settlement, and that sense of place included not only that part of Highland, but also adjoining sections of southeast Heartland, uh, northwest Milford, and northeast Brighton. Indeed, if you look at the membership roles for the West Highland Baptist Church, uh, or at the names in the cemetery there, there are a sizable number of folks who come out of those other adjoining townships. And that sense of identity was strengthened when, of course, Highland Post Office was established in West Highland, far, far to the west. Uh, the other island community, of course, is this one up here in the northeast. Uh, and it had more in common with neighboring White Lake, and in particular the old White Lake village, uh, than it did the rest of Highland Township. Many of the settlers in that area owned land in both localities. And of course, as we talked earlier, for many years, there was no good way to get from here directly up to there. Uh, on the other hand, the White Lake Trail, now Rose Center Road and White Lake Road, provided uh, ready access to old White Lake Village uh, with its taverns and shops. Pretty soon there was a stage line that ran along this road, so you could take the stage to Pontiac or to, to uh, Flint. Um, I think the most interesting thing about that is that uh, when the White Lake, First Baptist Church of White Lake got its start, the actual church building was right over the line here in Highland Township. So obviously these 
adjoining communities um, identified closely with each other. It wasn't until the railroad uh, came through in 1871 that this kind of northeast southwest divide starts to shift and it's replaced by a north south uh, divide that is centered on the railroad villages of Clyde and Highland Station. And with the gradual decline of Clyde, of course, uh, the Highland Station area is now what many people think of if they're asked to identify you know, what is the heart or center of, of Highland Township. Now, as was the case last time, there's a lot more I could say on all of these different topics. Uh, we've reached the end of our time, and um, I hope I've allowed you to imagine what living here must have been like in that period from 1832 to 1852 or so. Uh, if there's interest, I would love to do some of these again in the future. Uh, maybe pick some other aspect of uh, the township and hone in on it. Uh, if you have some ideas, please on our Facebook page, Highland Township Historical Society, um, let us know your thoughts. Otherwise, my thanks to Kathy and the library staff, and um, thank you.